Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Rojanski. I'm director of the Wilson Center's Kennan Institute, uh, as the background behind would indicate. And um, I'm very glad to be able to present this morning's event on race, racism, and diversity in Slavic and Eurasian studies, part of the Kennan Institute's uh, excellent Black History Month programming. Um, we're very grateful, of course, to our partners, especially uh, Professor de Fabritz from Howard University, who you'll uh, meet again in just a moment. She hosted a fantastic event uh, last week with Anna Makanju and Lenitra Berger, um, talking about opportunities for studying the region. Um, we're taking this month, uh, obviously, which you know you could go in any number of directions, but uh, the effort that we're making is to amplify the experience and the voices of African Americans, Africans, and Black people more broadly in the context of both Soviet history, that is to say, looking at the region, and contemporary U.S.-Russia relations and U.S. studies of the region. Uh, we believe promoting these, uh, these often under-recognized experiences is essential to our mission of improving American understanding of Russia, Ukraine, and the wider Eurasia region. Um, the Kennan Institute has always had two responsibilities. The first is, of course, our commitment to observing and providing scholarly analysis on Russia and the Eurasia region. But the second, and, and I would argue equally important, because we are an institution based in the United States, and in fact, we were founded uh, by George Kennan, Jim Billington, and Fred Starr to be a home for American universities situated in the Washington policy community, we have a responsibility to those American uh, scholars, to the US scholarly community, uh, and to those in this country who are seeking to study and understand the region. Um, over time, the Kennan Institute has worked hard to diversify, uh, to bring in a diversity of perspectives uh, from individuals uh, with different experiences who are interested in the region to come and be physically resident at the Institute to work with us and to partner with us. Um, as, as many of you will know well, our grant programs offer opportunities for young people uh, from around the world to come to the Kennan Institute and do research, although some of them are exclusively uh, for U.S. citizens. Um, and we have tried as much as we can to bring in a diversity of perspectives in, in all senses of that word. Um, we've also uh, expanded our programming to make sure that we include the voices of those who reside uh, beyond the traditional Washington DC beltway or the so-called Excella corridor. Um, counting since 2015, um, the vast majority of our awarded scholars have come uh, from uh, beyond the sort of traditional Ivy League or the, the famous uh, area studies centers. Um, and of course, we do recognize the, the issue of diversity in regional context. There's no question that diversity exists within Russia, uh, within Ukraine, within the, the Eurasian region uh, in many senses. And uh, we're always working hard, uh, not only to bring in scholars when we're able to bring scholars to the Kennan Institute in Washington or bring them virtually as we've done over the last year, um, from beyond, for example, Moscow, St. Petersburg, Kiev, uh, the kind of dominant uh, centers within the region. Um, just uh, to throw a, a couple of numbers at you, uh, in the last uh, several years, we have managed to bring in fellows, speakers, and authors from 35 out of the 85 uh, federal subjects uh, of the Russian Federation, uh, which is, I would, I would guess, I don't have hard data on it, probably a larger proportion of people from outside Moscow and St. Petersburg than you would typically hear from in a Western institution. So we're cognizant of that issue. It's certainly something that we continue to talk about and address. Um, the work is not done, but today's focus really is on the challenges to racial diversity uh, here in the field from the American standpoint, the challenges that we wrestle with much more broadly uh, here in the United States. And we hope that the conversation will shed light on those issues and underscore uh, the importance of them. We, we also invite you to take a look at our broader programming on the Black History Month collection page on our website. Um, it's linked directly off the Kennan Institute's home homepage. Um, you can see the past events, including the excellent one that I mentioned from last week and our upcoming events. And without further ado, I'm going to pass, I'm going to introduce and pass the floor to Dr. Lewis Porter, um, who is going to take you into the actual conversation, not the Preduslovia, which you were not necessarily looking forward to hearing from yours truly. Dr. Lewis Porter uh, is an assistant professor at Texas State University. He teaches courses on the history of Russia and Eurasia. His research focuses on Soviet internationalism and cultural diplomacy in the 20th century. And his current book project is titled Reds in Blue, The Soviet Encounter with International Organizations, which is a history of Soviet participation in UNESCO uh, during the Cold War, 
exploring Soviet experiences of the world, of, of world governance, world citizenship, and the international community. His PhD is from uh, UNC Chapel Hill in 2018. So as uh, Amaryllis uh, said to us before we started, this is the Young Guns panel, and we're really excited, especially those of us with lots of uh, gray cropping up, are very excited to bring you these voices. So Lewis, the floor is yours, take it away. Thank you, Matt, I appreciate it. Uh, so thank you all for joining us uh, for today's discussion on race, racism, uh, and diversity in Slavic and Eurasian studies. Uh, I'm pleased to be moderating today's event, which is part of the Kennan Institute's Black History Month programming. Over the past year, protests involving the Black Lives Matter movement have spurred organizations and universities to engage in discussions of race, racism, and diversity in their workplaces and schools. The Slavic and Eurasian studies field is not immune to these conversations. Today, many in the field are coming to terms with problems such as a lack of racial diversity among educators and students, issues of visibility and vulnerability for minorities who travel to the region, and both real and perceived unequal treatment on behalf of people of color. As part of the Kennan Institute's Black History Month programming, today's discussion will center around these issues facing the Slavic and Eurasian studies field today and what can be done to create a more equitable and thriving field for all. Uh, for those of you in the audience, if you'd like to ask a question, you can submit it um, either via email to kennan at wilsoncenter.org, via Twitter at Kennan Institute, or on our Facebook page. Please include your name and affiliation when sending questions. So now I'd like to introduce you uh, to our first speaker for today, Dr. Emerlis Lugo de Fabritz. Emerlis Lugo de Fabritz is the master instructor for Russian at Howard University's Department of World Languages and Cultures. She directs the only comprehensive Russian program at a historically black university, the Russian minor program, and she teaches language, literature, and culture courses. Her research interests include work in Russian and East European cinema, Russian literature of the 19th century and 20th century, Spanish language, literature, and culture, Spanish cinema of the post-Francoist era, and Cuban cinema, as well as gender studies. She received her master's degree in Russian, East European, and Central Asian studies from the Jackson School of International Studies at the University of Washington in Seattle. She then completed her doctorate in Slavic languages and literature also at the University of Washington. Amaryllis, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Louis, and uh, good morning, particularly those who are not on the East Coast. I know it's early, but this is an important topic. And firstly, thank you to the Kennan Institute for giving us this opportunity to talk about um, one of those uncomfortable conversations in our field. Um, and thank you to Howard University uh, for supporting Russian. This is our 60th year teaching Russian at Howard and to the US Russia Foundation. And we will talk, the second part of my presentation will be about outside, the importance of outside support for national programs to diversify our field. But um, I wanted to start with three basic philosophical and factoid uh, fa observations to point to the importance of diversity in our field and being much more explicit about dealing with it. Um, and the first one is sort of like some people might think obvious, but it needs to be stated. Language proficiency is a prerequisite for proper work in the field, be it language, literature, um, history, political science. If you cannot communicate, if you cannot read original documents, if you cannot parse through Levada uh, surveys, you cannot get your work done. So that's number one. Um, number two, diverse classroom is now the classroom. Among other things, we have seen an increase in minority serving institutions. They didn't move their populations did. Among them, we have University of Arizona, which is a flagship state university, but it's also a Hispanic serving institution. University of Illinois in Chicago. There are those that are not officially classified as MSIs right now, but serve large numbers of students of color. Chris Goff, my colleague, for instance, has a significant number of Cuban American students now wondering about that history and that interconnectivity, right? Um, now, the other reason is that these diverse classrooms are getting bigger. 
Montgomery County Public Schools, the 14th largest public system in the country right next to DC. The stats right now is that it's 48% female, 14% Asian American, 21% Black, 32% Hispanic. So self-identifying white is only 26%. So uh, these are the people that are coming into the classroom. So language proficiency is the requirement. The classroom is more diverse. And last but not least, um, we actually need a classroom. Uh, January 22nd, 2019, the Chronicle of Higher Education uh, published an article uh, where they reported a survey by the Modern Language Association. And they find out that from 2013 to 2016, the United States lost 651 language programs. Uh, so if we look at, say, a place like University of Arizona a State Land Grant University, part of the requirement to teach the language is to actually have people taking the language. So um, enter people like me. I am Puerto Rican. My first language was Spanish. I started Russian in the late Soviet period because an English teacher in my high school taught it. So she taught a couple of English courses and she taught Russian, right? And that's how that started. Um, Ever since, I've only met two other Puerto Ricans that teach in the field, and they're historians. So um, if you're a Puerto Rican that started working in the field in the late Soviet period in your language and literature, and you're working there, please put it in the chat box, because I would love to break the sense that I am the oldest Puerto Rican in the field. But as of right now, I think I am the oldest Puerto Rican in the language and literature field. And that right there is problem number one. How are we going to appeal to people that, and when they know that they're going to be the only ones, right? Furthermore, there's the fact that if you are a person of color and you're smart enough to do this Russia thing, you're smart enough to do other stuff. Anna Makanji, one of the observations that she made was that she took a pay cut to go work at the Obama administration. You go work for the National Security Council for the President of the United States, and you take a pay cut. Meantime, back at Howard, my competition is the School of Engineering, which just set up Google West. So I have Google GM offering to pay full rights to these students. And what can I offer other than the possibility of affecting national security a couple of years down the road, and you might have to take a pay cut. Having said that, Last but not least, and this is the important part for the strategic thinking here. And I'm going to give a shout out to Nina Yankovic um, at the Woodrow Wilson Center. She just put out this awesome, incredibly depressing report, Malign Creativity, How Gender, Sex, and Lies Are Weaponized Against Women Online. Um, you can also take that methodology and apply it to scholars of color, right? As scholars of color in the field, when we start talking about intersectionality, about ways that we can link our personal skills with scholarship. Um, yeah, this is an issue. Um, I know that I, as a graduate student, I at times was discouraged of using my Spanish skills to look at Soviet internationalism, right? We have this emerging number of young students coming up the pipeline uh, that have these skills. So how do we break this whole, I am the only one, US Russia Foundation provided external funding. So the importance of external funding to help support this. And Krista will talk about our digital think tank. We got a grant to create a national outreach program. It started small, we were just so fall 2019 and Kimberly was there, right? We had a group of students from Arizona, Puerto Rico and Howard University. They spent two days doing the DC thing. We visited think tanks, Georgetown, Sirius admissions office gave us an admissions talk for students. And the first thing we discovered what students of color one, they're spread out across the country. They came from Arizona, right? They're in Chicago, we're spread out. There's more of us, but it's thin. And two, they don't know what other options we have right? The one comment we got from that fall workshop was that I didn't know about joint degrees. There are opportunities that would attract them if they knew it, 
which again goes to the return on investment aspect of this whole thing. I can sell it to my parents a lot easier if I can tell them I'm going to be a lawyer and I'm going to do Russia along the way. Um, so in the spring, right, and this is like about two weeks before the world came to an end, we had an administrative conference at Howard, which included a panel where Kimberly presented, Sunny Rucker Chang from Cincinnati presented, and Amber Walden, who's an alumna of mine who now works at American Councils. And the conversation was really frank about what is it like to be a person of color doing research in Eastern Europe and Russia in the post-Soviet space. And Kimberly will share some perspectives on that. Let's just say it's challenging and scary. Having said that, two things happened. My assistant director of study abroad sent me an email the next morning saying, how do you prepare your students to go? Um, on the other side, follow that email from my teaching partner. Um, we got two minors out of that presentation. So students of color, right? They're not necessarily going to be scared by these conditions. However, they do need support. So it really behooves us, if only for the fact, going back right between 2013 and 2016, that was 651 language programs that were closed. If only for what in University of Washington, when I was a grad student, we called the FTE factor, full-time equivalencies. Um, if we want a pipeline of future specialists that deal not just with language and literature, but can engage issues like Russian disinformation campaigns targeted at communities of color in multiple languages, you know, targeted at voting populations to depress voting turnout in the United States. We need to look at this. Not, and at the personal level, I, I would like to meet another Puerto Rican in the field that does language and literature. That would be kind of nice, still waiting. And that's all she wrote, yeah. Thank you, Amaryllis. Um, just sort of as a reminder to the audience, uh, throughout the program, if you have questions for our guests, uh, you can submit them via email uh, to kenan at wilsoncenter.org, uh, via Twitter at Kennan Institute, or on our Facebook page. Uh, please include your name and affiliation when sending these questions. Uh, our next speaker is Kimberly St. Julian Varnon. Uh, Kimberly St. Julian Varnon is a doctoral student in the history department at the University of Pennsylvania. Her research examines how Black experience in the Soviet Union shaped Black identity and how the presence of people of color shaped ideas and understandings of race, ethnicity, uh, and nationality policy in the Soviet Union and the post-Soviet space. She received her master's degree in regional studies focusing on Russia, Eastern Europe, and Central Asia uh, from Harvard University. Kimberly. Thank you, Lewis, and thank you everyone for being here. Um, thank you to the Kinnan and Wilson Center for having me. Um, so I'm coming at this from a little interesting perspective in that I'm a graduate student now, but in between my master's degree and starting my PhD, I was also a community college educator and a high school history teacher. Think of anything you could teach in history, I probably taught it in the state of Texas. Um, so I have a very interesting view on, on the field, but also on the work that we do as educators. And so I'm gonna to try to approach this as give some kind of outline as I will talk about my time as a mentor with some of the Howard students and how that shaped them, but also how it shaped me, my experience as a graduate student, uh, my time as a researcher, and hopefully get into some of the teacher pipeline issues. Um, so I've had the experience, the great experience to be at Howard two or three times now, plus my interactions with the Howard students um, as part of the US Russia Foundation um, programming. And I told the Howard students, and I keep saying it, it was the first time I'd ever seen that many scholars of color in one place. Um, so there's lots of tears, lots of crying, just happy crying, because I never thought I would see a room like that. But I think that speaks to the need for diversity in our field and that for the longest time, I thought I was the only black person who did the work that I did. And then I found Lewis and <laughs> randomly. And I also knew of Alison Blakely, Dr. Alison Blakely, who started at Howard and who wrote Russia and the Negro, one of the cinema works 
seminal works on the Black presence in, in Russia and the Soviet Union, and Dr. Joy Gleason Carew, who works on African diaspora studies, who also writes about the Black experience. But besides those two people, I did not know of anyone who looked like me who did the work that I do. And so mentoring these students was important to me because I wanted them to understand that there is a place for people of color in our field. And there's also a, a presence of Black people in the region that needs to be studied and discussed. And often when people think of Russia, they think of it as this place that has no cultural or ethnic diversity. And we know that's fundamentally not true. And so I, I look at my work that way and that by helping students understand the diversity of Russia, but also the diversity in the field, we can help them understand their place in it because every student has a place in our field. And I think that's important to, to discuss. But also because of my experience as an undergrad, I went to Swarthmore. I was one of three black women who studied Russian. So I didn't know that there were not that many people of color in the field until I went to graduate school and I was the only person of color. And I went to ACs that year, I think it was 2012. I think I was the only like black person, um, unless Amarillo was there and I didn't see her in NOLA, like, and for our major national conference of scholars to be the only person of color, that's a problem. Right, and so when we're trying to bring in students and we're trying to create this pipeline between K through 12 education to Russian language programs and you know our regional language programs and studies into graduate school, if you do not see a person who looks like you, that is a big deterrent because you do have that sense of isolation. And I was lucky enough that I didn't have to experience that isolation until I was already in graduate school. I had already kind of joined the path because Swarthmore had other women, people who look like me who did Russian. Um, everyone should suffer learning Russian, right? There is no color to suffering when you're learning declensions. We all can do it together. Um, and so in graduate school, especially when I was going to Ukraine doing my master's research, um, I had issues that I had to face as a scholar that my cohort didn't. I had to make a plan to how I was going to get around Kiev. I had to, you know, I didn't go out at night unless I was with someone else. I stayed in hostels, so I was never by myself. And so these types of on the ground material aspects of going abroad, of doing research abroad, for students of color and researchers of color, this looks fundamentally different from our colleagues. And I think what happens is when we get into these discussions of racism and race in the region, and often it comes off as saying, oh, you're saying all of Russia is racist. You're saying Ukraine is racist. That isn't what we're saying. What we're saying is there are people who have racist beliefs in these regions, just as in the United States. And if we're going to be sending and recruiting students of color to go to the region, we have to prepare them for their unique experiences. But also we need this responsibility to not just be on educators of color. It's everyone's job if we're gonna have this field survive. Especially if we're competing with Google University, which I didn't even know was a thing, we have to be able to prepare and not only help the students, but it also means you have to be able to talk to their families. If anything happened to me in Ukraine, someone needed to be able to call my mother and my father and say that something happened to me, right? So these are conversations that we have to have with our students, but also within our greater field so we can make studying abroad and researching in the region as safe as possible. And so that kind of gets into what I do as a researcher. And Amarilla said this earlier, like she was kind of discouraged to using her Spanish language skills, you know, while working on her Slavic degree, because there is this kind of perception that you can't be the person you are and also do the work you do out in the field. And I originally, I worked on the Holodomor and Ukrainian history. My master's thesis is on the famine in Ukraine in 1932. Um, my current dissertation project stems from a paper I wrote in spring 2014, one of my last master's seminars. And I remember writing the paper, I said, this is the one and only time I'm gonna talk about black people in Russia because I did not wanna be pigeonholed as the black person who writes about black people in Russia because I knew that it would be a detriment. It could be detrimental to my academic career, right? And I think that fear speaks to some of the issues we need to address in the field. It should not be a negative to look at race and racism in the region because really what, what I found in my research is so much of our, our understanding of race and racism changes when we get to Eurasia. 
it's such a diverse place and with such a rich history that our typical understandings of ethnicity and race don't really work there. And I think that's a boon to not only the field, but also why studies of Eurasia have to be input into these greater conversations about race and racism and ethnicity. And what I found was, you know, there is a Black presence in the Soviet Union, and they have a variety of experiences from my first Kenan piece I wrote about African American visitors in the 30s to my piece I wrote and that was released yesterday about Andrew Lee going in the Brezhnev era, you see two fundamentally different experiences in the, so in the Soviet Union. So what happens is you have this really fascinating way of looking at Soviet history from a visitor's eyes because Brezhnev era Soviet Union, and I will admit, I thought it was boring. I'm a diehard Stalin era historian. That's what I think is really interesting. Looking at the Brezhnev era through Andrea Lee's eyes made me really interested in the late Soviet Union. And also thanks to my seminar, Dr. Ben Nathans, who made me interested in the late Soviet Union. But I think that if we look at foreign experiences in the region, especially Black experience in the region, we can write a richer history of the region. Not just focus on Moscow and Petersburg and Kiev, but looking at Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, where you have these travelers who go to Central Asia, they go to the Caucasus, and they have fundamentally different experiences with these people. They are calling them Black. Uzbeks are speaking Uzbek to people who, you know, who Black African American visitors. These are examples of the malleability of race and ethnicity that people are not talking about, that we in our field have the opportunity to get into. And I think that's just something that we need to express is not only as a field, do we need to bring in and kind of work with having students of color teachers of color, but also understanding that diversity is always a boon to the work that we do. It produces better research. It also makes us able to fight against these program cuts and to fight against this idea that Soviet Russian Eurasian history is its own special thing and that we aren't part of these greater conversations of European history, of Western history. Um, and these are the things that I look at and kind of deal with in my work. And finally, for the teacher pipeline, I teach in Texas. I taught at a public high school in Texas and I taught AP US history, I taught AP world history. And speaking honestly, coming from my own background, I grew up in rural Texas. I had no idea about Russia until I watched an eight hour mini series called Russia Land of the Czars on the History Channel. And I was like, Russia, oh my goodness, this place is wild. Rasputin, oh my goodness. And, and I never heard about Russia. While I was in high school, I was taking AP class, I didn't hear about Russia. So in my teaching, I made the effort to inject my background into history. And there was a meme floating around on Twitter, like, you know, these students don't know anything about World War II. And it's like, your students should know about Stalingrad, right? And most Americans don't know that. So when I teach, I try to create a space for the region in my work because our American students need to be aware of the world. And that's kind of how I approach it. And now I have students like in my community college who want to know more about Russia. They want to know more about Ukraine, right? And all it takes is that kernel for us to lay a foundation to you know widen the field both academically but also with the public because I think if we've learned anything in the past five years, there is a glut of information about the region and that type of that lack of information is dangerous both for the country but also for the people from the region who are here who have to deal with these discriminatory experiences as well. Overall, my final thing is diversity. When we look at race, racism, and diversity, all of us who work on this, this isn't just about scholars of color being more comfortable, being able to thrive in the field. Discrimination harms everyone, and that's what we see, right? And so I think that's why we have to do this work. And once again, thank everyone for coming. I talk really fast. I'm a former debater. If you have any questions, I'll clear anything up. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly. Um, I want to just briefly spotlight the piece that Kimberly mentioned uh, about Andrea Lee's great memoir um, from the late Soviet period, the late Brezhnev era, um, that's on the Wilson Center site at wilsoncenter.org. Um, so if you're interested in that at all, um, please go check it out um, on our website. Um, I also want to uh, mention once again that if you have any questions, uh, you can submit them via email to kennan at wilsoncenter.org, via Twitter at Kennan Institute, all one word. Um, or on our Facebook page, uh, please also include your name and affiliation uh, when sending these questions. Our uh, next and final speaker is Dr. Krista Golf. Dr. Krista Golf is an assistant professor of Russian and Soviet history at the University of Miami. She is also a former Title VIII scholar of the Kennan Institute. 
Her specialization is in the North Caucasus and the South Caucasus, uh, focusing on nationalism, citizenship, empire, ethnic conflict, and oral history. She recently published a book titled Nested Nationalism, Making and Unmaking Nations in the Soviet Caucasus, which is a study of the politics and practices that were used to manage national minority rights and communities during the Soviet Union. Krista. Uh, thanks very much, everyone. I just wanted to um, say thank you once again for the invitation to be here. Uh, Amaryllis and Kimberly already kind of have touched on the undergraduate mentoring program uh, that I've been working on, but I thought I would kind of sketch out a holistic overview of everything um, that is included to this point to just kind of give a sense of uh, what work is being done at the moment um, in the field to kind of um, help diversify it. Basically, we wouldn't be talking about this at all today if not for Amaryllis, who got everything started a couple of years ago and engaged the support of the US Russia Foundation to bring together um, undergraduate students studying Russian at Howard and um, at University of Arizona with Colleen Lucy at the University of Puerto Rico. And uh, the first event, as Amaryllis uh, said, was this kind of two-day professional and academic workshop based at Howard University and also kind of spanning a range of different professional and academic sites in DC. Kimberly and I both presented our work uh, to the students at this event. And I study ethnic minority populations in the caucuses that have been minoritized, uh, been told that they don't exist, had their histories erased. It was the second time I'd spoken about this work at Howard and it was just as impactful as my first experience. Uh, I really value the conversations I had with Amaryllis and Colleen students that day and the relationships I formed with those students. So I was really pleased um, to kind of find a position in this program to continue, um, continue working with uh, Amaryllis' efforts. Uh, an administrative meeting, as Amaryllis said, uh, followed in February 2020 at Howard University and then the pandemic hit. I think that was the last time I sat in a room physically uh, with my colleagues. Um, Amaryllis and Colleen had planned to take a group of students to Russia that summer, um, but the trip obviously had to be canceled. And so Amaryllis and Kelly Nickmeyer Cummings, um, also at Howard, Colleen Lucy and I then kind of worked over the summer to pivot uh, the program to an online format as so many other people were doing last year and uh, ultimately found new opportunities in this kind of unexpected um, situation. So over this past summer, the four of us worked to develop two new programs uh, to replace the canceled Russia trip, a cybersecurity simulation led by Ambassador Bonnie Jenkins, who is the founder and executive director of Women of Color Advancing Peace, Security and Conflict Transformation, and who actually um, was just recently nominated to serve as Undersecretary for Arms Control and International Security Affairs. And the other program that we designed uh, was an undergraduate think tank that culminated in students presenting their research at ASIS and uh, at the ASIS conference and completing group digital projects that will be hosted on the Howard University website shortly. This developed into a kind of major outreach campaign to recruit and support uh, students underrepresented in Slavic and Eurasian studies. And more than 70 students from eight different universities ended up participating in these two projects in the fall of 2020, as well as around a dozen faculty members, uh, mentors like Kimberly, who advise student research groups in the think tank and the cyber simulation, and um, also campus faculty who supported the participating students uh, from their campuses. None of this basically would have been possible without this huge collective effort um, from people in the field, including Assis. Um, Linda Park spent countless hours with us uh, incorporating the think tank into the conference uh, last fall. We sought to achieve a number of goals with this um, fall 2020 project. At the first student meeting at Howard in 2019 and the second meeting in February 2020, uh, participating students stressed how impactful it was for them to come together at these events and build fellowship and mentoring relationships, how powerful it was uh, for them to see that they weren't alone in the room. And with both the think tank and the cyber sim, we thus wanted to kind of continue to help fostering a sense of community and belonging to welcome undergraduate students to the field and help them see it as um, a possibility for academic and professional pursuits in the future, but also to continue to kind of build networks of support that would help prepare these students for the unique challenges and difficulties they might face um, studying, conducting research, teaching in this field and support them when they did encounter those experiences. We wanted these programs to kind of assist in creating horizontal networks across the cohort of participating undergraduate students, um, as well as vertical ones that would link them to graduate students, faculty, non-academic professionals who could mentor them 
and help make Slavic and Eurasian studies feel kind of less isolating um, for students and faculty of color in the future. So based on student feedback um, that we received after the students presented at ASIS, we could kind of see that the programs made a difference uh, for these students. Several students, for example, commented that they liked meeting and learning uh, from other students of color in the field because it made them feel less alone. And they also raved about their fellow students and their faculty mentors, kind of remarking on their fellow students' brilliance and originality, uh, but also on their advisor's extraordinary mentorship and thanking them for fostering an atmosphere that felt more like a community than a group of students working with faculty. We also wanted to kind of empower the students while helping them build new skills and supporting their kind of professionalization, understanding of course that not all students are interested in an academic career like we pursued, and thus offering different types of programs as well as access to mentors in both academia and other professions. As part of this, we organized a career panel at ASIS for undergraduates interested in learning about careers outside the academy, like journalism, policy work, international law careers, business consulting, and so on. We wanted to showcase for them the kind of wide range of opportunities available to them, as well as help them kind of build those networks in the fields that they were interested in pursuing. Students also increased their research, writing, communication, presentation, and technical skills. A lot of the uh, Think Tank students, for example, learned how to create their own podcasts for their digital projects. I think Kimberly mentored a bunch of students who worked on a podcast. And an additionally important part of this dynamic of the think tank was that we wanted to foster student autonomy and form research groups and recruit mentors around student interests rather than impose um, kind of those forms on them. So in this way, the program was very much kind of flexibly constructed around um, the students' goals. In their reports uh, to this regard, Students highlighted that the skills that the think tank helped them develop and how it pushed them to grow. As one student put it, not only as students, but as leaders. Several of them commented that they were so nervous before they presented at ASIS, as many of us still are to this day, but they felt supported by the audience uh, who attended their panels, who engaged with their work, and through these really positive interactions they had um, in November, felt motivated to continue studying Slavic and Eurasian studies and consider a career in this field. Many students also explained how these presentations made them feel more confident in themselves, in their academic skills, and in their ability to excel in this field. Confidence was a word that came up probably in 70% of uh, the student reports that I read. Finally, we made a number of decisions um, last summer to try and make these programs as inclusive as possible. We aimed firstly to eliminate or at least ameliorate financial barriers by providing students with stipends that they could use however they wanted um, to buy books, to buy a laptop if they didn't have one, um, maybe to work a few less hours at a job so they had a little bit of time to work on the think tank. Um, so student stipends were a major component of this project. Uh, while the program was centered around a few institutions, namely Howard, Arizona, um, University of Miami, University of Illinois at Chicago, George Mason, we also included a number of uh, students from three other universities, some of whom were the only participants from their school. And we're aiming to kind of increase this contingent of individual students uh, this year who might feel a little bit more isolated, lacking a, a bigger program around them. As Amaryllis notes uh, in an article that's coming out in News <laughs> Newsnet soon, we also sought to kind of undercut some of the exclusionary and elitist practices um, that might you know, bar students from entering the field, like requiring students to have a high level of Russian language knowledge or access to Russian studies before participating in the program. So we welcomed you know, any student who expressed an interest and a desire um, to kind of learn more. I thought I would end uh, by just kind of commenting briefly on our plans moving forward and how people can kind of help participate in these initiatives. Uh, the US Russia Foundation has very generously funded another year of the think tank and cyber simulation. Um, so we're just about to put out a call for student applications to the think tank. ASIS will hopefully be, um, you know, allowing us to distribute this via their networks to kind of widen the accessibility of this application this year. And Amaryllis and Kelly also have students at Howard who are supported by the fellowship and working to gather more data on Slavic and Eurasian studies. We know that the field, statistically speaking, is not representative of the diversity of the general population and having more data in this regard will kind of allow us to better understand where we can go from here, um, but also you know, what resources and challenges we might not yet be aware of. This initiative builds on years of efforts <laughs> to expand networks 
of underrepresented students and scholars in this field and increase understanding of the unique challenges that they face. And we hope that others will kind of work with us to continue to build capacity from elementary, junior high schools to universities to support networks of mentorship, fellowship and opportunities and foster greater inclusion in the field as a whole. So I urge you to get involved <laughs> as an academic or professional mentor this year, um, help by sharing our upcoming call for applications. Let us know if you're working on something that you know, can kind of be combined with the efforts that we're working on. Um, but please let us know you're out there and get in touch. You can contact any of us um, to kind of start engaging in this project. Thanks very much. And I just wanted to sort of add the thank you to the Canon because particularly for the fall conference and throughout all of this, the Canon has been wonderful at sharing resources. I met Krista because I called the Canon. I would like somebody to present to my students and they're like, you know, Krista Goff is working here and she's cool. And <laughs> next thing I know, now I have a whole fan club of titular nationalities scholarship. Um, and they, John Drassen came and presented, along with Emily Kuchu, who was an intern at that time, mm -hmm. sharing what life at a think tank was like. So I really do want to say, also say thank you to the Canon, because throughout my years at Howard, they have been sort of there helping to inform students about other options. So there's a lot of partners that are not getting thanked, uh, that have been really been in it for like 10 years for just not enough time right now. But I wanted to thank, shout out the Canon because they have also been part of this trip along the way. It's a huge collective effort. <laughs> okay, so we're now gonna move into the question and answer uh, phase of the session. Uh, once again, if you have questions, uh, you can submit them via email to Kenan at wilsoncenter.org. Uh, via Twitter at Kennan Institute or uh, on our Facebook page. Please include, once again, your name and affiliation uh, when sending in these questions. Uh, while questions are coming in, I thought I'd sort of kick it off uh, with my own, um, sort of open-ended. Um, this was kind of touched on uh, by all the speakers. Um, but my question is, um, so in the last year, the pandemic has really inflicted tremendous economic pain um, on everyone, uh, but particularly communities of color. Um, on a separate kind of avenue with the pandemic, um, it has also worsened the long-term uh, fiscal crisis of, of higher education, um, which has led to a decline in job security, as well as some dim career prospects uh, for many graduate students within Eurasian and Slavic studies, but really across the board. Uh, so my question is, how do we reconcile the need to make the field of Eurasian and, uh, and Slavic studies more equitable with this kind of broader economic crisis and the crisis of contingency and adjunctification um, and kind of the decline of stable traditional academic careers. Um, so I can go first and I, as a graduate student in his, Russian history, and I'm kind of living this right now. Um, I think one of the big reasons I think of of regional studies, but also kind of non-STEM focused education, liberal arts education is important is because you need to train the entire student. And I think one of the key things is, and I taught at a community college where we do very targeted education. You can't prepare students for jobs that may not exist in 10 years, but having a, a well-rounded student, if you can teach your students to think critically and to be malleable and adaptable, I think that's a benefit for the student, but also across the economy. And I think that a particular aspect of when we look at higher education is so often we allow these narratives of economic security and promised economic security to deter students of color away from the humanities and from different, you know, unless it, there's really a focus on business and STEM, but that leads to us being underrepresented across the board. And from my perspective, when we do that, we tend to create these spaces in which only the independently wealthy can study. Right? And I think that's that harms the field, but also it harms the ideas that we can share with the public about the region. right? And so that's kind of how I approach it. But it is very much the thing of being able to tell a student there are job possibilities and it may require you to retool. You may not use Russian every day, but learning Russian, having your brain use these skills will be beneficial to you later. And I got as a graduate student knowing that after this seven year process, there may not be a job for me 
Um, like it is scary, but I also know I love teaching. I'll happily go back to my high school classroom. I'll go back to my community college classroom. Um, because for me, this is a great opportunity, but my purpose is to help the public understand the region that I love and to understand that there's a black presence for that. And so I think if we change this idea fundamentally that you do not go to college just to get a job, it'll kind of help us alleviate some of these fears. And that goes to speaking with students and with parents because I'm a first generation college student. My parents are like, how are you gonna pay your bills? All right, so it's still a conversation we have, but kind of changing the perspective of that conversation is important. So I'm a master instructor um, at Howard finally, right? But that's senior lecturer, I mean, in most places, which means I am not tenure track, but it's a renewable every three years teaching focus position, right? So yeah, part of my hope is that by first helping more students expand the field, it becomes clear that we need this field, right? Um, two, it more diversity means we rethink, right? As Krista pointed out, part a big part of this is I became the website manager for my department so that in part so that I can put up this website. I can now show these students a place that they can put in the resume where it was related to Russia, but look, I can put a digital humanities project together and seeing how technology is so important, this is something I can do for you. Um, and last, if you can do Russia, you can do pretty much anything. So it's important to help add these additional work skills right into our classroom programs so they can do these digital projects so they can show that i can go travel and negotiate multiple environments so if you need somebody to help run your company it's you know i did research in russia what's your point right uh yeah i don't have too much um to add beyond what Kimberly and Emeralis already said, but you know, I think we try to kind of consciously think about um, how we were gonna design these programs in the fall and build networks for the students who participated not only in academia, but outside of academia, right? So we offered the cyber simulation experience, the think tank experience. We had this panel um, at a CIS uh, where they could meet mentors in a variety of different careers. And also, you know, whether they participate in the think tank or the cyber sim, they gain professionalization skills that will help them in whatever career <laughs> they end up pursuing. Um, they gain more confidence. Many of them, you know, remarked on that aspect of it. They improve their presentation skills, their digital knowledge, working with groups. The students were working with students across the country <laughs> at a variety of different universities. Um, so they were kind of tackling the challenge that a lot of us are tackling these days on Zoom. And also, you know, the stipends were a part of um, this conversation as well. You know, we're working in classrooms with students right now whose struggles are very real and we're having conversations with them about how they can get through the semester, the extra hours that they're working um, to support themselves and their families. And we hope that with the stipends, you know, we could make it possible for students to participate who maybe wouldn't have had the time to otherwise. Maybe they could work a few less hours to spend that time um, on the think tank kind of you know, feeding that interest and that passion. Uh, so, you know, we've tried to do what we can to kind of provide opportunities and resources to students to support them. And, you know, we'll continue to try to think about what we can do in the future uh, with that aim. Thank you. Um, I think I'll pass it over to Matt, who I believe uh, has a question. Yeah, thank you, Lewis. I also uh, want to take the chance to, um, Thank you all again for this panel. You know, Amaryllis and Krista, your discussion of the student uh, think tank and student opportunities, um, particularly when it comes to undergrads, is particularly welcome for us at the Kennan Institute because, you know, this is not the first year in which we've thought about the problem of the pipeline. You know, how do you get how do you get young people involved early enough? That they can come to us at the Kennan Institute. You know, we mostly we we teach undergrads. You know, sort of in our personal capacities. I mean, I, you know, I have taught at American University. Of course, now I only teach graduate students at SICE. But um, basically, our statutory role is is for much more senior scholars, right? At at the very youngest end for us would be recently minted PhDs. That would be a, a very small number of maybe masters uh, and and PhD candidates. 
And so one answer is, oh, it's not our problem, right? The pipeline is what it is. That's what universities give us. But of course, that's that's not a very satisfying answer, and that's not how you solve problems. So, you know, this is this is a hopeful step. Um, and working in partnership with universities is something that we want to we want to keep doing. I, I also want to underscore something that has been maybe a subtext to, to what uh, a number of you have said, and that's the role of government. Um, all of these programs that were named, I mean, Kennan itself, right? You know, uh, we're, we're a government institution. We're part of the Wilson Center. It's a taxpayer-funded federal national memorial. Um, the U.S. Russia Foundation, that was taxpayer money. Uh, you know, that was, that was the Freedom Support Act uh, in the beginning of the 1990s. It's a legacy of that taxpayer investment. Uh, Title VIII was mentioned, Title VI, supporting regional study centers. Um, I don't know if anybody mentioned FLAS, foreign language and area uh, studies. That's that's what allowed me to study Russian in graduate school. Um, these are all government programs. And very fittingly, you know, George Kennan, um, whose long telegram uh, has its 75th anniversary this very month, uh, actually wrote, you know, a lot of people focus on the containment uh, language. It's actually only one line. Um, he has five recommendations at the end of the long telegram, and two of them are actually about supporting study of Russia uh, or the then Soviet Union. And, and in one of them, he says very explicitly, he says, um, the media and universities can't do this by themselves. The government support is needed. And I think that's something that, especially in our kind of late 20th century, 21st century um, American political culture, we're, we're very resistant to accepting that there are certain things that government must do. Um, but I just want to come right out and say, I think this is something government must do. Uh, and to the extent that government is for all of the people of our country, and again, that's the part of our work that focuses here on this country where we live and uh, which we serve, um, that needs to be a, a pipeline growing exercise of bringing as many people and as diverse a set of people as possible into the field. So. I just want to say, as someone who is, you know, leads a taxpayer-funded institution sitting in the heart of Washington D.C., this is our job. So, so we need to keep investing in it. Um, and I do have a question, actually, um, Kimberly. If it's okay, I want to kind of take off on on your um, wonderful discussion about, you know, history and kind of coming to history, um, uh, not necessarily having had an entree to it in in your own lived experience growing up. I I really know. Um, that feeling in my case, it was kind of the opposite that I was pushed away from studying the history of this region because my family had a horrible and traumatic history in the region. You know, stay away, don't go there. It's bad, it's scary. Um, but you know your your personal experience always has to end up in some way informing your storytelling. History is, of course, storytelling. So I'd be very interested um, in any personal reflections you want to share about the way in which personal experience informs informs your storytelling. And, and the second um, kind of part of the question to take off on your excellent piece about Andrea Lee is I'm recalling the discussion last week in in uh, in the event that you moderated, Amaryllis, um, where Anna Makanju made the point about how kind of just sitting at the table would shut down some of the, that, that her as a black woman sitting at the table in the US delegation would shut down some of the finger wagging uh, kind of propaganda nonsense uh, from the Russian side. But that said, we know very well that there are real issues. And so when foreign government officials, perhaps with nefarious motives, I think more often than not with nefarious motives, are citing real problems in our society, um, I wonder from the standpoint of scholars, and maybe you can project a little bit for your students and for the next generation, potential future diplomats, um, how do you manage that? You know, you don't want to say, no, this is a non-issue, right? You don't want to sort of say, we never air dirty laundry. Um, but at the same time, you don't want to be, you don't want to let these things become instrumentalized or you personally become instrumentalized in, in these tense relationships. So that's a whole set of questions, but. Uh, that's a good question. Um... So I think that in terms of personal experience in research, it I am a Texan and I grew up in this big nationalistic state and I didn't know other people didn't say the pledge to their state every day and didn't know the like state song. And so I guess like I, that was one reason I was into Russia was <laughs> I kind of saw it similar to Texas. Um, but also I think that the, the past traumas, right? So I moved away from American history because so much of what I was taught about American history was slavery and like the pains of the civil rights movement. And I just, I turned off and I didn't want to think about that. 
Um, and so when I started learning about Russia, it really was, I learned about Peter the Great, I learned about Rasputin and these like personalities that were so, that were just bigger like than anything I'd ever heard. And I wasn't actually exposed to Russian and Soviet history until I was an undergrad. Um, and my first class I signed up for was Angels of Death, Rush Under Lenin and Stalin, right? The sexiest title you could give a class. And so like, since then I was hooked, I, I was fascinated. And really my dissertation project comes from my experience in Ukraine. And I, I was, you know, a black woman in the space and I ran into an Afro-Ukrainian girl on the street and we just hugged each other. Like in the middle of Christology, right? We saw each other and we just hugged. And I was like, what are you doing here? And she's like, what are you doing here? <laughs> And I, I and I asked her, I'm like, are you a student? Like, where are you from? She's like, no, I'm Ukrainian. And I'm like, oh my goodness. You know, and so from that, I wanted to see, I'm like, were there other people like me who had been to this space and there were. And I think that just having that personal connection and kind of understanding and, and processing my own feelings being in the region. Before I'd been to Ukraine, I'd been to Bulgaria, I'd been to Serbia. So I had have experience in the region. And I kind of wanted to understand like these very unique experiences that I had. And it's something you only get when you're the only person who looks like you in a place. And I think that when we look at issues of race and racism and, and the question of how do we grapple with these issues and, and Russia and the Soviet Union for a long time, they have been the person wagging the finger at us about our own domestic racism. And I think that one, it's useful, right? Because it has forced the United States in many ways to understand and grapple with issues of racism in the country. And like recently, I think even over the summer, you know, Putin had his comments about the BLM protests. One of the things we have to understand is if we do not want, you know, antagonistic foreign powers to use racism and our issues of racism against us, we have to start addressing these issues within our own borders. Um, and I think that there is a fine line between addressing these issues as a person of color in the field and kind of like, having our words and, and, and actions being instrumentalized by Russia or kind of against, you know, by other antagonistic powers against the United States. I think it's a fine line, but I can't control how Russia may use my words, how Putin may use my words. But what I can do is use my work to show that yes, there's racism in the United States, there's racism, you know, in every country, but also this is how race looked like in the Soviet Union. And this idea that racism doesn't exist, like that's clearly not true. And when, I, and when I think about it from this, dealing with racism in the United States and dealing with issues of racism against Central Asians and Caucasians in Russia and in the Eurasia, like these are equal problems that we have to address. This is human suffering across the board. And that's kind of like how I look at it. Um, but from an academic standpoint, it is kind of the benefit where you know, you write a book and maybe 10 people in the field read it. So maybe it's not that important <laughs> compared to like policymakers and, and diplomats. Um, so who knows, like, I, I hope my work will help in this situation. Um, but you know, that's, you know, six, seven years down the line. But I, I think it's important that we have these conversations. Because if we don't want Russia wagging its finger at us by being, you know, having issues with race, we have to deal with them. That's the only way we can stop it. I don't know if Amaryllis or Crystal wanted to add anything um, or respond to Matt's question. Um, just sort of on the previous comment on institutional uh, environment, right? I wanted to observe just coming along with Kimberly about the institutionalized racism. Um, part of making it more hospitable in the Slavic field is also we sort of start spreading the wealth. There are spaces in the academy that have just become the comfortable place to hang out, right? Um, I remember uh, in the late Soviet period when I went, Leningrad is not St. Petersburg, completely, completely different places, but I went to Leningrad and I know my mom looked at me and said, you could have majored in Spanish and gone to San Juan. Instead, you're going to Leningrad in January, right? But kudos to my parents, they let me go, right? But the fact is, if you really want to develop this diverse group of scholars, you gotta make it so that, you know, I walk into the foreign languages department, I look at the Russian classroom during shopping period, I go to the Spanish classroom, right? And the Spanish classroom already has the fully developed multicultural curriculum and tons of experiential learning opportunities. 
you know, it's uh, it, it's it behooves us to really think about the implications of how do we engage so that that pipeline keeps moving. So um, I guess we'll move on to questions from the audience. Um, so there's a question from from uh, Emily Couch uh, at the National Endowment for Democracy. Uh, as the speakers have mentioned, creating a more racially equitable space uh, in REECA studies is not just the task of people of color. How can we encourage white students in the field to support their peers of color, both in the classroom and while in the region as well? I don't know if maybe Kimberly wants to start or. Uh, sure. So I'll make mine quick. I think one of the best things is for like white students in cohorts to support students of color. And if you see something or hear something that you think is inappropriate directed towards student of color, say something. Often we have to kind of quietly suffer because you don't want to be the noisy wheel, right? You don't want to be the problem maker, but also kind of advocating for diversity in your own programs is important. And uh, that's something I applaud my alma mater, the Davis Center. The students at the Davis Center have really kind of led the charge with that. Um, and so I, I think it's not only also the students are important, but also we need faculty, people who hold institutional power to also be engaged in that. Um, outside of you know your classmates, right, being open to just being aware that your different your opportunity is going to be different. Also, um, as somebody who got, yeah, I haven't seen a single Latino professor in my Slavic studies. Uh, faculty just needs to be willing to sit down and be open and have those sort of difficult conversations with the students, be it when you're preparing to send your black student to Ukraine, right? Um, I ended up at University of Washington. I did not start there. I'm, I'm going to state that. And the reason why I did finish is because when I did get to University of Washington, right, um, Galia Dimet, who was one of our main professors there, um, she looked at me like, why aren't you using Spanish as a European language? Because I got told I couldn't. And next thing you know, she is recommending that I go take classes with a colleague of her that does Spanish internationalism. And that's how I got to finally do the internationalism thing and use my Spanish, you know, for my master's thesis and my dissertation. So uh, for the students, be open, be supportive, but for faculty, don't be afraid. You actually have more opportunities, more capability, more skills. And be open to be student. I know this is like pedagogy 101. Be student centered, right? Ask your students, okay, what's your strength? And sometimes, yeah, the student will come in and bring the project fully baked just because you said go. Um, and particularly, this is where I turned to Krista because in her classroom, right? Um, they don't officially teach Russian at University of Miami yet. How many students do you have taking independent study? in Russian. How many students do you have? A lot, like 10 to 20 a year. OK, so it's not like it doesn't have demand. That's a fallacy. All right, Krista Goff in Miami with Cuban American students with that kind of a cohort of students. And she's got students doing it as independent study. Okay, so um, we have another question from Adrian Edgar uh, from the Department of History at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, it's, she writes, it seems to me that many students, especially first generation and underrepresented minorities, first have, have an opportunity to encounter less commonly taught languages such as Russian at community colleges. And I wonder whether there are any efforts afoot to recruit students more widely to begin studying Russian at community colleges. So from the community college standpoint, I, I'm speaking from Texas, our students, um, they only get financial aid for the courses that are required for their degree plans. So it's very hard to get students in 
language courses in general. Um, but I do not think it's Title VIII. One of the title grants, there is a grant for community college educators to develop their own courses. And it's like 25% of the course has to be about the region. Um, but like a community college would have to do it through independent study. But there are a couple of community colleges in Texas that are offering Russian now. Um, and I was really excited about that because I wanted to keep up my skills. But I think, so with community college, you have to address the issue of not only the pipeline, but figuring out a way to fit Russian or less commonly taught languages into this greater degree plan so they can get financial aid for it. But that's something that I've been thinking about from my own experience teaching community college. But also I read all your work. Hello, Dr. Hager. Okay, uh, our next question comes from Kevin Platt at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, he writes, as researchers and educators working on race, ethnicity, and nation in these fields, I'm certain that you have confronted racist attitudes in working with people and institutions in the region, as many of us have. Often I find myself being told that, quote, that's, a, that's your problem, slash political correctness, slash politics. Don't tell me, slash us, what to think about this. But as a researcher, one becomes more and more imbricated in communities of various sorts in the region. How have you dealt with issues of racism and discrimination in the area? Do you have strategies for engaging with these matters and working to raise consciousness in a way that can be productive? All right, that's the old, that's the old woman in the room. Um, I have to say that a big part of it was I never disconnected from the communities of color at my institutions. I did my undergraduate study at Brown University and I was a Russian major from day one. But at the same time, I was still connected with the Federation for Puerto Rican Students, the American Student Organization. So um, we, the short answer is if you're nice to us in the classroom, we start figuring it out and eventually you apply for a grant, you figure out grant writing is way above your pay grade, but you know what, I have to do grant writing because that's why we got over 70 students of different backgrounds in this amazing project. So um, as the old woman in, in the room, uh, when you realize that all you're gonna have is, you know, Professor Alexander Lev Levitsky at Brown, check burly bear man but one of my favorite professors uh you know it's if the professors if the mentors are open and listening and supportive to what your personal needs are and what your research goals are um that goes a long way uh i guess i never you know it just never saw anybody so why would I, you know, it's kind of funny. Like I'm always looking backwards, never looking forward. I never assume I'm gonna see anybody ahead of me, but I'm definitely sure that if I work it, I can make, make it better for those behind me. Um, and this is where I, again, I point to Krista, right? Um, and her group in Miami, if you look backwards and you're open, you end up with so many students taking independent study in Russia to work with you in, on, in Russian history. So Kimberly, you're younger. <laughs> uh, quickly, I think that I, and especially since I've started writing publicly about racism, I have gotten a lot of really terrible feedback. Um, and I wanna, because uh, going into the, like the conversations we've had about like the mistreatment women have on the internet because of what we do. Um, but what, one of the big reasons I chose Penn is because my advisor, Dr. Nathan, so when I explained to him like my concerns about going to the region for research and the things I faced, he made it very clear to me like I did not have to put myself in a position where I would be physically unsafe or emotionally unsafe to do my research. And that was one of the first times someone said, your work is important, but your being is more important. Um, and I think that's really, that's really special and really important for students. Um, but also I kind of look at it this way. I grew up in the South. Um, I grew up, my parents had a segregated school. So I've kind of always fought against these ideas, but having support and having, and having professors who don't understand what I'm gonna go through. I don't need them to kind of understand. I need them to know 
that I need support and to offer that support. I think that's key. And as we get more engaged with our communities, and I've as I go to the space, like I went to Ukraine, I ran into skinheads and that was terrible. But the overwhelming majority of the people I met in Ukraine were so welcoming and nice to me and took care of me. Um, like my quickly, my favorite story is I went to get Slodolet. I got ice cream every day. Slodolet, no, that's the Serbian word for ice cream. I got ice cream every day after the archive and I like became friends with the lady at the ice cream store. And she would ask me, does your mom know you're here? Does she know you're going around by yourself? Um, and just that, like those little connections were so important to me. Oh uh, yeah, there we go. <laughs> I forgot the word for ice cream in Russian. Sorry, all my Russian professors. Um, but I think that's important too, why getting students to the region is also important because there you have that upfront fear, but the connections you make with people in the region helps so much. It's one of the reasons I came back to do what I do is because I, I love what I do and I love the people in Ukraine and in Russia, and I, I wanna keep doing this work. If I could just um, chip in with a couple of ideas connecting some of the questions. You know, obviously the field needs to be more accountable to the people in the region that we're studying. We also need to be more accountable to ourselves. And, you know, creating a more racially equitable field doesn't just benefit, you know, underrepresented students and faculty, but the field as a whole. And I think that that's something that people still need to kind of understand. And, you know, we have to listen to how we can better support our students and have conversations with all of our students, right? Uh, about how to be a good colleague, how to how to support the students that they're studying abroad with, um, how to recognize you know unique challenges that students are experiencing during research, during study abroad. Um, but it's also about you know as educators educating ourselves, and it seems kind of basic, but learning how we can better support our students um, to take seriously their safety and other concerns and not be dismissive when they talk about fears that they might have. Um, so it, it's, you know, not just a passive thing, but an active thing that we need to be doing um, as educators at our universities. And, you know, going back to uh, Matt's comment about government support for these programs and what Amaryllis has been saying, you know, Amaryllis is a master instructor at her school. I'm teaching at a school that doesn't have a Russia program. We don't teach the language. Um, students can study it through me, but otherwise, you know, there's just kind of piecemeal uh, access to resources on campus. And so, it's also about on these campuses kind of fighting that trend to defund Russian studies and to shrink Russian studies programs and to not have tenure track language instructors and culture instructors and literature instructors. And, um, you know, even lacking a program at my school, we had so many students from Miami who had applied to the cyber sim and the think tank overwhelmingly represented in both of those programs. And a large part of that was because we didn't have those barriers to entry. Um, for the students who didn't have access to Russian language programs. My students had the same access the other students had in this program, and it was a transformative experience for a lot of them who have been kind of really looking for that um, and not being able to find uh, so many resources on campus itself. So these types of programs can be good um, for kind of supplementing the, the lack of support that the field has at a lot of institutions in the, in the country. And as far as the FinTech and CyberCM, we did have one rule, just show up, you know, bring those basic professional skills, show up on time, show up prepared, the rest will work out. And that is something we need to sort of take from the Spanish studies field, which is, again, much more accessible from that point of view. Okay, so um, unfortunately we're out of time. There were other questions, um, but I'd like to thank uh, everyone for coming uh, today and for our great uh, panel. I think this was a really insightful uh, discussion. So thank you to the audience for attending um, and thank you everyone uh, for providing such an intellectually stimulating discussion. Lewis, thank you very much. And, and thank you to all the panelists as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.